I feel sorry for the Buddhists. I feel sorry for the Muslims. I feel sorry for the atheists this morning that don't have anything to get excited about like you and I do. They don't have the thrill, the joy, nor the excitement of knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And he is coming again. I stood uh, a number of years ago uh, on Mars Hill. And I stood there in, in right outside of the city of Athens near the Parthenon and was uh, standing there where he preached that powerful sermon. When he got to the point of the resurrection, the people that were listening to him said this, when they heard of resurrection, some mocked. Now, their descendants are still among us uh, even today. Even though the resurrection, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, has been proven, uh, without any degree of doubt whatsoever, history has shown that Jesus came up out of the grave. And yet these people today, they will still mock, they will still sneer, and they still doubt. Uh, over the last 2,000 years or so, there have really been three schools of thought uh, that raise arguments about the resurrection. Uh, one argument is that Mary somehow went to the wrong grave. In the midst of her grief, in the midst of her sorrow, in the midst of all of the excitement of that morning, uh, she ran to the wrong grave. But, but the Bible tells us uh, in Matthew chapter 27 in verse 61, 61 that the women watched as they placed Jesus in the tomb. She didn't make a mistake. She knew exactly which tomb that it was. By the way, there was a second visit. She would not have gone to the wrong tomb twice. And then there is the argument called the swoon theory or the coma theory, that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, uh, that he just lapsed uh, into a comatose state. And when they took his body down from the cross and they put it in um, that old cold, damp, dark grave, that the coldness and that drop in temperature uh, created some kind of uh, trauma with him and that woke him up out of that comatose state. Well, let's think just a minute about that uh, with me, if you will, at all of the evidences that Scripture gives us that verified the death of the Lord Jesus. You will remember in Mark chapter 15, I hope you have your Bible and we'll look there with me just a minute. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 44, I think is a powerful passage uh, in dealing with this theory. Verse 44 says, And Pilate marveled if he were already dead. He wondered. Uh, I want to make sure that Jesus is dead. He called him the centurion, the very one that was in charge of the whole activity of Calvary. He asked him whether he had already died. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph, a uh, powerful witness. The centurion verified that Jesus had died. If he had somehow made a mistake and Jesus was still alive, it would have meant instant death for that centurion. That was Roman law. So you better know that he made sure uh, that he was dead. You'll also remember uh, that uh, the soldier came by and uh, they were breaking the, the, the legs of the others that were crucified there. But the Bible says when they came to the body of Jesus hanging there on the cross, they saw that he was already dead, so they did not break his legs. There's number two. And then you remember too, the friends verified his death. They were given his body. 
And the Bible says that they anointed his body with spices. In other words, they embalmed his body and they wrapped his body in grave clothes. Do you think for one minute that the people that loved the Lord Jesus the most would have wrapped his body in grave clothes had they not known that he was dead? But one of the more powerful evidences of his death was when that soldier came by and stuck a spear in the side of Jesus. And the Bible says that outflowed water and blood. The medical profession has studied this numerous times and drew the conclusion that this was complete verification of the death of the Lord because of the breakdown of the water and the blood. It proved that he had cardiac rupture and would have killed him instantly. Yes, Jesus was dead. He was not in a coma. He was not swooning in that grave. And then there is the argument that his body was stolen, probably the most silly of all of the arguments. Some say that he was stolen by the Roman and the Jewish authorities. Well, think with me for just a minute about how illogical that is. After the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, his disciples went all over the known world preaching the gospel of Jesus, preaching the good news, preaching the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And people were being saved and they were turning to God by faith in Jesus Christ. And all the authorities would have had to have done, they would have produced the body of Jesus and said, look here, that gospel's nothing but a lie and it would have stopped the whole movement. Some say that his friends stole the body. We know that that didn't happen. Look with me, if you will, at Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, and I want you to see beginning in verse number 11. Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 11. The Bible says, Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Let me just say to you, that if these Roman guards and Roman soldiers were dealing with a full deck, if their elevator stopped on all of the floors, they would have never, ever, ever agreed to such a pact as this. Why? Because if they had allowed the disciples of Jesus to have stolen the body of the Lord, it would have meant instantaneous death. They wouldn't even have to go to trial. They would have been killed immediately. Matthew chapter 27, verse 62. Just look back a few verses. Now the next day that followed, the day after preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people he has risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, you have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. And they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Let me say to you, church, only the power of God could have removed that body out of that grave. Only the power of God could have rolled that stone away. Only the power of God could have escaped the watch of those Roman soldiers who with both eyes and both ears were listening and watching to discover any kind of movement that would have taken his body away. Only the power of God could have rolled that stone away and taken that body away from that grave. Only God did it. Another reason why the thieves couldn't do it is one of the more intriguing answers to that dilemma in John chapter 20. And look with me, if you will, at verse number four. John chapter 20 and verse number four. And I want you to see 
uh, through verse 7 with me, if you will. John 20 and verse 4. So they ran both together. Here are the disciples. Now they're running to find out if what Mary saw was really true or not. They ran together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, watch this, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then came Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place hmm, by itself. Let me ask you about a thief for a minute. If you were a grave robber, uh, would you have taken the time to have taken that body's clothes and folded them up and situated and positioned them in the same position that they were in while the body was lying there? Absolutely not. Any thief has one motive in mind. Let's grab it and get out of here. Let's grab it and let's go. Let's steal it and let's run. But when these disciples showed up, there the grave clothes lie, just like they were on the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus simply came through the clothes. He emanated out of that body that was both invisible and physical at the same time. You say, preacher, Explain that one. I wish I could. I don't know how to explain that. The only explanation I can give you, it's the same body that ate fish just a little while later. It's the same body that walked through doors a little bit later. <laughs> it's the same body that you and I are going to be given one of these days. You understand that those who refuse to believe in the historicity of this are refusing historical facts. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. That's my introduction this morning. Um, I'm not real interested today about the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. I've settled that a long time ago. But I am interested in the results of the resurrection. What happened after the resurrection? Well, let me dig in real quickly with you if I can. First of all, the resurrection proved that his claims were true. Now, I found out in the last two services uh, that, that I don't have time to give all of the biblical references but let me just help you with some of the claims that he made about himself. First of all, he claimed to be the son of God. If you look in Matthew chapter 14, the high priest was asking him, are you the son of the most blessed? And Jesus looked back at that high priest and he said, I am. I am the son of the most blessed. And his resurrection proved that he was. Second, he proved that he was the Lord of the Sabbath. In Mark chapter two and verse 28, the Bible says, so the son of man is even the Lord of the Sabbath and the resurrection proved it. Let me give you the third claim. He claimed to have power to forgive sins on the earth. You, you see the power of God to reach down into the innermost part of a man and forgive his sins and wash his sins and to cleanse his sins was proven by the resurrection. In Mark chapter two, verse 10, the Bible says, so that you might know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sin. Let me tell you what else the, the resurrection proved and verified his claims to be God. Now, boy, this stirred up a whole bunch. When Jesus claimed that he was God, he would make statements like this. When you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Now, the Jewish authorities could handle a whole bunch of stuff, but they couldn't handle that. They could handle the fact that he was a prophet of God. They could handle that all right. They could handle it all right when they just considered him to be a lunatic who claimed that he was the Messiah. 
They can do all right with that. Oh, but when he got to that point that he claimed to be God, it stirred them up like nothing else. Do you, you understand the cult groups that have been by my house and been by your house, I've had these kinds of conversations with them and I am sure that you do too. When you take them over to the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John and, and, and you show them I and the Father are one and their prompt answer and pat answer, oh yes, we understand, but what that means is, is that he is one in purpose. That's not what the Word says. The Word says that he and the Father are not one in purpose but they are one, one. Jesus said, whatever you have seen me do. Over 30 times in the word of God, Jesus refers to this. When you have seen me do some things, you've also seen the Father do some things. They are exactly the same. So the resurrection proves his claims to be God. Listen, if he were not God, the Lord Jesus deserves an Oscar like no other actor has ever received. Let me give you the fifth one. He claimed to be the only way to God. He claimed to be the only way to God. I'm still hearing about that one today, aren't you? Oprah, not too long ago, uh, was talking about spiritual things and the question came up about uh, who the Lord Jesus Christ was and the question was, is he the only way to God? And Oprah says, no, I, I believe that there are many, many ways to God. There's a very popular evangelical pastor who I listen to on uh, one of the talk shows. I also listen to him uh, on uh, one of the news channels. And he was asked that same question in both settings, in both venues. Do you believe that Jesus is the only way to God? And he smiles real big and shows all of the teeth. And, and he says, well, you know, I, you know, I, I kind of leave those questions. I, I, I'm very broad-minded when it comes to things like that. And I just leave those kinds of questions to God. Well, the problem about being broad-minded, it, it's like a river. The broader that river, the more shallow the water is. And the broader you get theologically, the more shallow uh, you become. Jesus in John chapter 14 said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And may I say that those early apostles marched all over the Roman Empire preaching that gospel, that there was salvation in no one else. That's a big claim that was verified in the resurrection. The resurrection proved that what he said about himself was true in that he said, I will Rise again. Do you know that 17 times in the Word of God, Jesus referred to the fact that he would not stay in the grave. He would come up out of the grave, that he would rise again. In Luke chapter 9, I'll give you one of those references. In Luke chapter 9, if you'll look at verse number 22. In Luke chapter 9, verse 22. Uh, he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be slain and be raised the third day. Let, let me make a statement here, and I, I think you'll see the logic behind this with me. Only a lunatic would make the claims that I will rise from the dead and it not be true. Because the fact of the matter is, if he did not rise like he said that he was going to do, then the whole movement that he was trying to establish to begin with would have never gotten off the ground. But his resurrection proved what he said 17 times. I will rise again. The Romans wrote him off. The Jews wrote him off. His contemporaries wrote him off. I'm here to tell you on this Easter Sunday morning, God raised him from the dead and because his claims are true. 
Let me give you number two. Because he lives, his death is saving. In 1 Corinthians 15, 17, the Bible says, if Christ be not raised, our faith is in vain, it's futile, and we are still in our sins. Do you know what I'm excited about this morning? You, Pastor, you, you, you just kind of out there a little bit this morning. You, you, you've got a lot of excitement going on. Why is that? Because the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen, proved that the cross worked. I can only imagine what heaven must have been like on the day on that first Easter Sunday morning when Jesus came up out of that grave, how that the angels of glory must have shouted all over heaven, the cross worked, the cross worked, redemption plan has worked. He's risen from the dead. It worked. His claims are true. He didn't just die a martyr's death. He didn't just die to show how tough he was. He didn't just die to set a tremendous example. I'm telling you on this Easter Sunday morning when Jesus was hanging there on that cross and his rich red royal blood began to flow down that wooden beam, God was etching salvation across the horizons of eternity forever and shouting, the cross worked. It worked. By the way, before I go any further, let me parenthetically give you a statement. People don't go to hell because of their sin. People go to hell because they refuse the blood of Jesus Christ to cover their sin. Let me give you number three. The resurrection proves that I have eternal life and you can have it too. I love the story of Lazarus. Jesus, you remember, was uh, about four days away before he ever showed up down there to Bethany and he didn't even go up to Mary and Martha's house. He just outside and word got to Mary and Martha that Jesus had finally showed up and they, they went on down to where he was and got right in his face and said, Lord, if you'd been here, our brother hadn't died. <laughs> Jesus said, oh, you'll see your brother again. Oh, you can just hear the, the, the snidness of their remark. Oh, yeah, we, we know. We'll see him at the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said, well, you're looking at the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Mm. You, you could have eternal Life. People ask me all of the time. Ask me even between services today. Pastor, well, what is it that's keeping you going today in the midst of this horrible culture when we're getting up and reading all of the bad news that's there? When we're looking today at the corruption and the filth and the immorality and the crass materialism, what is it that keeps you going. I want to tell you, the very thing that keeps me going today is the fact that because he lives, I am going to live too. That's what keeps me going. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gives a wonderful analogy about the farmer as he goes over to the wheat field and he cuts down the first stalk and he carries that first stalk of wheat up to the house of worship and he's waving it as he's going and he says, hey boys, uh, this is the first one, but there's a whole lot more coming. I'm telling you, when Jesus came up out of that grave, he was the first fruits of all that will believe and he shouted to all of mankind forever, I'm the first, but there's a whole lot more coming after me. Because he lives, I live too. Because he lives, you can live too. The other day, Kathy and I were somewhere, don't remember where, I've been trying to rack my brain all morning where we were when we saw this thing. And she looked at it and said, Mike, what in the world is that thing? I said, well, honey, it's a cocoon. You, you, you know what a cocoon is, don't you? you? You know, it starts out with that little caterpillar, probably one of the ugliest little I don't know what you call those things that you've ever, they, they go along the ground. 
They're in the midst of all of the muck and the mire and the dirt and the filth and the, the trash of the world and they're just inching along. That old caterpillar, he'll hump up a little bit and he'll walk and got about 38 legs and humps up a little bit and go, it'd take him three weeks to get from that side over there to that side over there. That slow, not worth, worth much. When I was a kid, I, I, I just, I didn't ever think nothing about it. I'd just go over and just put them out of their misery. <laughs> but that old caterpillar, he'd spin a cocoon and he'd wrap up in that cocoon. While he's in that cocoon, there's a metamorphosis that occurs out of pain and heartache and sorrow and death. And that metamorphic change happens and then the cocoon kind of splits and out comes not a caterpillar that is along the dregs of this life but out comes a beautiful multicolored butterfly that is now flying above all of the garbage of this world. You, you understand one of these days <laughs> You and I are going to have a cataclysmic change physically in our bodies. We're going to be given a brand new body made all over. I'm praying mine's going to be thin. <laughs> I asked the Lord this morning when I was looking up here at our, our, our praise team and I said, God, you know, I don't want to ask too much, but could I have some hair like, like Darrell's got? I'd love to have some of that hair. We're going to be given a new body that is never going to be experiencing pain and heartache and difficulty and sorrow. I'm going to have to wear any glasses anymore. Because he lives, I will never die. That sends chills up my spine to know that I... Listen, if you ever read in the, in the paper that Mike Whitson died, don't you believe it. I'm more alive than I've ever been before, kicking up gold dust on the streets of glory. I'm winging it with the angels in heaven. It's a lie. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Let me give you number four. I've got to hurry. Because divine power, I have divine power because he lives. I, I, think, I think about those cowardly, namby-pamby, weak-kneed disciples that were around Jesus. They couldn't even hang with him while he was on trial. They, they couldn't even pray with him while he was in the garden. They, they, they had nothing going on for them. They, they were not there at the cross when he died. And yet when I turn over to the first few chapters of the book of Acts, I, I'm saying, what happened to y'all? Here you are preaching. You, you sorry, low down, good for nothing sinners who nailed Jesus to the cross. If, if you don't repent and get saved, you're gonna die and go to hell. And I'm thinking, wow, what happened to you? I'm going to tell you what happened to him. The resurrection happened. Jesus fulfilled what he said that he was going to do. You, you understand, you don't have to wait for a metamorphosis to take place in you physically because the very day that you turn away from, the Lord, from sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and place your faith in him, he takes up residence in you and you have divine power. And ladies and gentlemen, listen, that separates us from the unbelievers. The unbelievers are going through this world in their own power, in their own strength, in their own energy, in their own wisdom. Oh, but when you get saved, God takes up residence in you and you have divine power that lives through you throughout the rest of your life. He walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. What an advantage that we have. And then the last thing that I want to give you, and that doesn't mean we're going home, but the last thing that I want to give you today is that the resurrection proves that judgment is absolutely sure. Look with me, if you will, at Acts chapter 17. And I want you to see verse 30. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. 
whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. The scripture says, I assure you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ that, that there is a judgment day that is coming. Y'all want some good news this morning? Shake your head like that. Pastor, I'd like some good news. We're winding down here. and Before I go, I want some good news. I, I, I'm glad you do. Those who have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life, those that have professed Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, place their faith in him, trust in him, this word's not about them right there. Why is that? Because our sins have already been judged at Calvary and we will never ever have to be judged for those sins ever again. Jesus became sin who knew no sin that you and I might be made the righteousness of God through him. Isn't that a wonderful thing? We, we'll never be judged in our sins. Our sins have already been judged there at Calvary. I, I read an interesting article this week uh, it was just intriguing to me. On April the 17th in 1976, the Cincinnati Reds were playing the San Francisco Giants at uh, the Reds' home field. It was before the game uh, really got started. And all of the Cincinnati Reds were up in a huddle. They were just bundled up together out in center field. The game was about to start, and they were all huddled up out there in center field. And everybody in the stands wondering, what, what, what's going on here? The announcers were thinking, what in the world is going on? But it was discovered that a swarm of bees had come and hovered over the first base line for a little while. And, and, and there they, they flew over and got into the corner of the Cincinnati Reds dugout. And the Reds couldn't even be in the dugout. So they ran. Well, they didn't nobody what to do. But there was a guy in the stands that day that had tremendous amount of bee experience. He and another guy got up and went down to the field and that beekeeper went in and he isolated the queen bee. He got stung multiple times, but he got the queen bee and he walked out with that queen bee and following him, was about 10,000 other bees. One day, the Lord Jesus Christ got up and he walked out of that grave and he carried with him the power of death, hell, and the grave that the power of that has no power over us anymore. He took the stings of your sin and my sin upon himself and he brought into captivity death held in the grave to the point that it doesn't even have to be in our vocabulary anymore he is risen and because he's alive we live too to God be the glory Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.